Okay, so uh, thanks, Katya, for the uh, invitation. So here is my outline. So I will focus on uh, uniqueness results for several inverse problems. So I will first quickly review the classical Calderon problem, and then we'll talk about two fractional Calderon problems. So they can be viewed as non-local analogs of the classical problem. And then I will introduce two inverse problems for fractional parabolic equations with power type nonlinear release. So these problems can be viewed as a parabolic nonlinear variant of the fractional Calderon problem. So the first two parts are preliminaries and the third part is the main topic. Okay, so first I will fix some notations. So N is the space dimension, S is the fractional power, and omega is always a bounded domain with smooth boundary partial omega. And omega E is the exterior of omega. And this angle uh, bracket is the standard distributional pairing. And HSU is the standard L2 base sublift space WS2. Okay, so first um, I'm going to talk about the classical Calderon problem. So the question is, can we determine the electrical conductivity of a medium by making voltage and current measurements at its boundary? So this problem was proposed by AP Calderon. And here is its mathematical formulation. So suppose we have a conductor in the region omega and gamma x is the electrical conductivity at x. And we apply a voltage on the boundary partial omega and it's induced voltage inside omega is U. So by Ohm's law, we know that the current at the point X is negative gamma X times gradient UX. And we assume there are no sinks or sources of current. So the divergence of the current is zero everywhere inside omega. So we have this uh, conductivity equation inside omega. This is the second order elliptic equation and U satisfies this boundary condition. You restrict it to partial omega is F. So we have this initially problem. So to formulate uh, the inverse problem, we need to define the so-called usually to Neumann map, uh, denoted by lambda gamma. So it maps F, which is the voltage on boundary to gamma partial U partial nu. So this is the current on the boundary when restricted to partial omega. Okay, so the inverse, the inverse problem is, can we determine gamma from the knowledge of lambda gamma? And the answer is yes. And this is the fundamental uh, uniqueness theorem for classical Calderon problem. It was proved by Sylvester and Woolman in 1987. So this is the statement. So suppose n is no less than three, uh, gamma is strictly positive and 
it has C2 regularity. Then we conclude that gamma can be determined from lambda gamma inside the domain omega. Okay, so the, the key point is that uh, the conductivity equation can be reduced to Schrodinger equation by using this substitution. So if we make this substitution, we can convert the original Dirichlet problem into this Schrodinger form. So we have this Schrodinger type stationary Schrodinger type equation inside omega. And also one um, boundary condition. So to prove the uniqueness theorem, it suffices to determine Q, the potential Q from uh, VM map lambda Q associated with this Schrodinger usually problem. And there are two main ingredients uh, in the proof. So the first one is the integral identity for DM maps. So let uj be the solution of this problem corresponding to qj and fj. Then the assumption on DM maps lambda q1 equals lambda q2 can be interpreted as this integral. And the second ingredient is the construction of uh, complex geometrical optic solutions, CGO solutions. So we are particularly interested in uh, solutions in this form. And here, vectors eta, k, and l uh, need to satisfy uh, these relations. And phi need to satisfy this uh, decay condition. So we call this kind of solutions, CGO solutions. So once uh, we have construct we have constructed our CGO solutions. Uh, for each fixed k, we let L go to infinity. And we take the limit in the integral identity to obtain this. So you can see the left hand side is a Fourier transform. So we can conclude that Q1 equals Q2 inside omega. So this is the unique the proof of the uh, the proof of the uniqueness theorem for the classical Kelderman problem. So here are a few remarks. So in the statement, uh, we suppose n is no less than three. And it's actually true. Uh, for the two dimensional case. But a different proof is required, since here. Uh, in this proof, you have to choose three uh, vectors which are orthogonal to each other, which is impossible in. Uh, two-dimensional space and here uh, a few here are some of the people who who make uh, who may who have made contributions to the two-dimensional case okay and also uh, the partial data Calderon problem has been studied so here we consider this partial DM map. So that is, we only have the partial knowledge of the standard DM map. So here the support of F is contained in 
gamma one. And we only have uh, the information of lambda gamma um, uh, on gamma two. So both gamma one and gamma two are open subsets of a partial omega. So the question is to determine gamma inside omega from partial knowledge of DMF. So this problem is open in general, but much progress has been made so far. So here I uh, list some people who have made contributions in this direction. Okay, so this is the classical Calderon problem. It, it dates back to 1980s and it is still an active research area. And more recently, um, now local operators uh, get much attention. So now local operators, uh, including the fractional Laplacian, arise in problems involving anomalous diffusion. And they have many applications in probability theory, physics, uh, biology, and finance. A simple example in probability theory is this. So a continuous limit of discrete long jump random walks a little bit process can be uh, described by this fundamental fractional parabolic equation. And one of the motivations of the fractional Calderon problem is to have a fractional analog of the classical Calderon problem. Okay, so first let me quickly review the definition of fractional Laplace. Uh, so for convenience, we will always uh, assume S is between zero and one. So first we have the classical Fourier transform definition. So here, uh, Fractional Laplacian can be interpreted as a pseudo differential operator uh, corresponding to the symbol, which has power to S. And we also have the classical singular integral definition. So here we have to keep uh, the principal value notation since the integrand here is singular near x. And a more useful definition for us is this one, uh, which is introduced by uh, Tafarelli and Sylvester about uh, 15, 15, 15 years ago. So we call it Caffarelli Sylvester extension definition. So here, uh, fractional Laplacian is interpreted as a Dirichlet to Neumann map associated with this extension problem in the upper. Upper half m plus one dimensional space. So the main advantage of this CS definition is that it relates the fraction operator to, so this is non local operator, relate this fractional Laplacian to a local problem. Okay, so 
based on this CS definition and some column estimates. Uh, we obtain this unique continuation property of fractional Laplace. So here is the statement. So we have now empty and open set W. And if fractional Laplace in U equals U equals zero in W, then we conclude that U is zero in the whole space. So this property is a typical non-local phenomenon. So it's clearly not true if uh, S is one. And you will see uh, this unique continuation property plays uh, a fundamental role in solving inverse problems for fractional operators. Okay, so now let's formulate the fractional Calderon problem. Okay, so we consider this exterior Dirichlet problem. So you can see here we replace the classical Laplace by the fractional Laplace. And since this operator is non local, we replace the boundary condition by this exterior condition. And we define the associated Dirichlet to Neumann map, lambda q. So it maps the exterior data g to fractional Laplace in U restricted to omega E. And we remarked that the knowledge of this map, <coughs> lambda cube, is equivalent to the knowledge of the so-called non-local Neumann operator defined here. it has been shown that NS approaches the classical Neumann derivative as S goes to one. So you can see uh, the problem here is a natural non-local analog of the classical Calderon problem. Okay, so the inverse problem is to determine Q from the DM map lambda Q. And the following is the fundamental uniqueness theorem. It was proved by Gosh, Salo, and Woman in uh, 2016. So here we suppose n is no less than two and q has, q is bounded and non-negative and w1, w2 are not empty open, uh, open subsets of omega e. So the conclusion is that we can determine q inside omega from partial knowledge of lambda q. So this is a partial, uh, partial data result. And actually we have a, uni a uniform way to uh, deal with Rn. So compared with a classical problem, um, fractional problem is relatively more straightforward. Okay, so there are two main ingredients in a proof. So the first one is standard uh, integral identity for 
usually to Neumann maps. So this is similar to the integral identity for so DM maps associated with the classical problem. And the second ingredient is is special for the fraction operators. So it is the wrong approximation property, uh, which is based on the unique continuation property of the fractional Laplacian. Okay, so there is another version of the fractional Calderon problem. So the previous one can be can be viewed as a Schrodinger version. And now I introduce the conductivity version. So here we have this classical conductivity operator denoted by L gamma. And we define its fractional power L S gamma by using the semigroup E to negative T L gamma. And we remark that this uh, semigroup approach works for more general self adjoint non negative operators. Uh, but here, uh, let's restrict ourselves to L S gamma for convenience. Uh, you can also see that uh, when gamma is the constant function one in the whole space, in a special case, uh, the fractional operator defined in this way coincides with the previous equivalent definitions of fractional Laplacian. So this is a, this is a generalization of fractional Laplacian. Okay, so now let's formulate the conductivity type fractional Calderon problem. So we consider this exterior usually problem. And we define the associated DM map. And the inverse problem is to determine gamma from lambda gamma. So the answer is positive, and it was proven uh, by Gosh and Woolman uh, last year. So here are the main ingredients of the proof. So first, the unique continuation results for the classical parabolic equation. So the semi-group definition suggests that um, there are some relations between this fractional operator and the classical parabolic equation. And also the generalized UCP for fractional operator. So here we have the same statement as before, but here we replace the fractional Laplacian by the more general, uh, by the more general fractional operator, L S gamma. It was. Uh, this was first proved by uh, Gosh, Ling, and Xiao in 2017. And Gosh and Woman also proved this by using a different method. And the third ingredient is uh, to reduce this fractional problem to the classical Calderon problem, which enables us to apply the old uniqueness results to solve this fractional problem. OK, 
Okay, so, so far I have introduced two versions of fractional countdown problem. So actually, uh, there are many works in this direction. So here I just mentioned a few. So if you, if your names are missing, I, uh, I apologize in advance. So here are some variants of the fractional Calderon problem. Uh, they include local perturbation of fractional Laplacian, non-local perturbation of fractional Laplacian, and space-time fractional parabolic operator, uh, fractional magnetic operators, uh, fractional elasticity, operators involving fractional gradients, and also uh, fractional operators on closed manifolds. Okay, so let's move on to the main part of this talk. So I will introduce two nonlinear fractional parabolic problems. Okay, so let's start with the first problem. So here we consider uh, inverse problems associated with this nonlinear fractional parabolic equation. So here, the nonlinearity A has this form. And here, the powers are not necessarily integers. Okay, so to formulate uh, the inverse problem, we consider this initial exterior problem. So we have this fractional equation in the space-time cylinder, and we have this uh, exterior condition, and we also have this zero uh, initial condition. And we define the DM map lambda A. It maps the uh, exterior data G to fractional Laplace in U restricted to uh, omega E times zero T. Okay, so the inverse problem is to determine the nonlinearity A from partial measurements of the associated DM map lambda A. So the answer for this question is yes. And this is the main theorem. Okay, so first let's look at the forward problem part. So we use the standard substitution uh, W equals U minus G. So we can study the initial value of the problem instead. So this is uh, the IVP, and we consider the semi group associated with this linear fractional parabolic problem. And for each fixed F, we define this nonlinear map by this integral.
and based on estimates on the semigroup S omega, we can use fixed point theorem for the nonlinear map capital F to construct the solution of this initial value problem in the following space for small function little f. And here, uh, the powers P, Q, and R depend on the values of N, S, and the nonlinear radius A. And we can also prove the following L infinity inequality. So here, U is a solution of this nonlinear problem. And we can show that the L infinity bound of U can be controlled by L infinity bound of F and L infinity bound of little g. Okay, so this is the forward problem part. And for the inverse problem part, uh, there are three main ingredients. So first, the unique continuation property of fractional Laplacian. And the second one is the wrong approximation property associated with the fractional parabolic operator. And the third one is first order linear, uh, linearization. So this relates the nonlinear problem to the linear one. So here I remarks that um, there is a method called higher order multiple for linearization first introduced uh, by Kulilev Lassus Woman in 2018 to deal with inverse problems for uh, classical hyperbolic equations. And this linearization method has wide applications in solving uh, different kinds of different kinds of inverse problems for power type classical equations. So here are some of the people who have made contributions in this direction. So, but here, uh, for the fraction operator, since we have the strong unique continuation property and wrong approximation property. I only plan to use first order uh, linearization, no higher order linearization in the proof. Okay, so here is the first order linearization uh, statement. So UG is the solution of this linear problem. And U lambda G is the solution of this nonlinear problem corresponding to the exterior data lambda G. And we can show that uh, U lambda G over lambda goes to UG as lambda goes to zero in L infinity norm. And this is the wrong approximation property of the fractional parabolic operator. So it was based on the unique continuation property of the fractional Laplacian. I think it was first proved by uh, Rulan Sello in 
2017. So this is the statement. So the conclusion is that uh, the solution set associated with the linear fractional parabolic problem is dense in L2 space. Okay, so now we are prepared to uh, sketch the proof of the main theorem. This theorem. Okay, so we let UJ be the solution of this nonlinear fractional parabolic problem corresponding to AJ. And based on assumption on the MFs and unique continuation property of fractional Laplacian, we can first show that U1 and U2 are the same, and we can in the whole in the whole space, and we can denote both of them by U. And then we have this identity. So here R I1 is the sum of remaining terms in the nonlinearity A. So the key point in the proof is that we can write this expression as the sum of two terms. And based on wrong approximation property, linearization, and L infinity estimates, we can choose G, ex exterior data G, such that both these two terms can be arbitrarily small um, as lambda goes to zero. So this is how we, uh, how we conclude that A11 is equal to A21. And then we can repeat this process, uh, this process and iteratively show AM, A1M equals A2M. So this is how we prove the main theorem for the first parabolic problem. And the second parabolic problem uh, has more explicit background, uh, porous medium equations. So let's first take a look at the classical PME. So it appears in models for gas flow through porous media. It has many applications in high energy physics and population dynamics. And now let's look at the fractional equation. So you can see here we uh, replace classical Laplacian by the fractional Laplacian. So this is a natural combination of fractional diffusion and porous medium nonlinearities. So roughly speaking, it describes anomalous diffusion through porous media. So I remarked that this problem is different from the first parabolic problem. So mainly because here the power term is inside the fractional term. Okay, so uh, to formulate the inverse problem, we consider this initial 
exterior problem. So we have this uh, fractional equation inside space-time cylinder. Exterior, exterior data G, zero initial condition. And here recall that here the fractional operator L S gamma is defined by the semi-group definition on a previous page. And here conductivity gamma and absorption coefficient lambda are both time independent. They are, only, they are functions of the space variable x. Okay, and we define this EMF lambda gamma uh, uh, capital lambda uh, gamma lambda. Okay, so the inverse problem is to determine both coefficients from partial measurements of the associated DMF. Okay, so the answer for this question is yes, and this is the main theorem for the fractional PME. And let's first take a look at the forward problem part. As usual, we make this uh, substitution to study this IVP instead. And we consider this operator, capital A, in this Hilbert space, H negative S omega. Uh, and the domain is dA given by this set. And it has been shown that this operator, this nonlinear operator, A is maximal monotone. That is, it is monotone and the range of identity map plus A is the whole space. So once we have this, we can apply theory of monotone operators in Hilbert spaces to show the well postness. So for any L2 F, uh, we know that there exists a unique solution in this space of this initial value problem. So this is the forward problem part. And for the inverse problem part, and there are two main ingredients. So the first one is time integral transform. So this helps us to relate the nonlinear, this nonlinear parabolic problem to the linear elliptic problem. So we will be able to apply the uniqueness results proved by Gosh and Woolman for the fractional, for the conductivity version fractional Calderon problem to determine gamma here. And the second ingredient is uh, the unique continuation property of the fraction operator. So once we determine gamma, we apply UCP to determine the absorption coefficient lambda. So here I remark that time integral transform methods have been used in solving the inverse problem for the classical PME. So in a classical case, 
um, these authors use time integral transform methods to determine both gamma and lambda. So a more careful uh, analysis is required there. But here, since we have UCP, something special for the fraction operator. So uh, the argument is simplified. And once we determine gamma, we can determine lambda quickly, thanks to the UCP. Okay, so in the rest of time, I will quickly sketch the proof of the main theorem. Okay, so first we make a substitution v equals u to n, and we define the associated DM map tilde lambda, and tilde lambda is equivalent to lambda. And uh, we are interested in exterior data tilde G, which has this form, H times G zero. Here G zero is time independent and H is a positive constant. So we are interested in the behavior of V when H goes to infinity. So we consider this time integral transform. And if we apply this transform to the problem here, we can write the parabolic problem in this elliptic form. And the key point is that we can write VH here in this way. Here V zero is the solution of this linear elliptic problem. So this is exactly the same problem studied in the fractional Calderon problem. And we can estimate the remainder Rh. We know that we can show that it is O H one over M uh, in HS norm when H goes to infinity. Okay, so once we have this, we can take fractional operator on both sides of this identity to obtain this. And we take the limit. And then we can see that DM map associated with this nonlinear parabolic problem can be determined by the DM map associated with the linear elliptic problem. So this enables us to apply the uniqueness theorem for the fractional Calderon problem to determine the conductivity, gamma. Okay, so once we have determined gamma, we just pick a non-zero g. And here uj is the solution of this problem corresponding to lambda j. So here we can denote both gamma one and gamma two by gamma. And now we apply unique continuation property of uh, fractional Laplacian, uh, sorry, uh, of the fractional operator Ls gamma to show that u1, u2 are the same. 
in the whole space and we denote both of them by u. And we can also apply UCP to show that the sequence in the cylinder such that u x k p k is now vanishing. So we can determine lambda by using the limit of this quotient based on this equation. Okay, so this is how we determine uh, the absorption coefficient lambda. Okay, so if you are more if you are interested in more details, so here are the references. So the first one is a survey paper, including the history of the classical Calderon problem. And the second and third papers cover the two versions of fractional Calderon problem I covered in part two. And the last two papers covered the the fractional, the nonlinear fractional parabolic problems covered in part three. So that's all I need to cover today. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Lee, for the very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Any questions or comments, please? Okay, I have just one small question. Is it possible, do you think, to add some non-linearity in your second result? Uh, I think for inverse problem part, it works. So I think the main problem is maybe it's hard to show the, hard to show the well-posedness of the forward problem. So if this is uh, if this is a nonlinear term, I think uh, I don't know how to prove this. <laughs> Maybe it works. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Hey, Kataya, uh, can I ask a question? Please, please. Um, yeah, so I just have a very, uh, very general um, question. So uh, if we use the fractional operator, uh, uh, do you think it uh, helps in uh, the stability in the inverse problem or compare that, I mean, compared with the classical uh, uh, Calderon's problem? Because uh, it's a non-local operator. So I just have this uh, oh, Sorry, so... Uh... So you're asking about the stability? Uh, no, I mean, just uh, 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 in general, how oh. uh, can this uh, non-local uh, non fraction operator help in solving new Earth problems? In general, I see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very uh, uh, philosophical question. <laughs> uh, I think the so the main difference between the fractional and the classical problem is the, the unique continuation property. So this one, but we don't have this for the for the classical Laplacian. Okay. Yeah, so we we can see we uh, repeatedly apply this proposition in, in solving fractional problems. So this is a very strong property. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I got it, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? If not, thank you very much, Lee, for the very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone, for coming. Thank you, thank, thank you. you.